wants a business is to control their destiny. John Coton, the second editor of Inc. Magazine, we did a lot of work with Inc. through the years, has a beautiful definition of entrepreneurship. He said, it's the ultimate expression of oneself. Ariel Moody, a young man, a young Jewish man of color who we've worked with, who has his own business and grew up in a bad section of Brooklyn, when there were bad sections of Brooklyn, said it's a way out. To him, entrepreneurship is a way out. The goal of this session is to recognize what are the roots of accomplished entrepreneurs, its power, potential, and its Jewish connection. First, I'm gonna go into an intro of my background, the intro to the series itself where you'll meet all the players. We'll explore two chapters and we'll conclude with very special messaging that connects us di directly to the Jewish mission in business. Our journey, mine and Nan's journey. I wanna share aspects of it with you because I think you'll better understand where we're coming from, where I'm coming from in some of this analysis. Ever since I was very, when I was very young, I had to work for everything. We were given nothing in my house. I started working at jobs outside the house when I was 10 years old. I started my first business with a friend when I was 16. We bought records at a wholesale place in Brooklyn and we sold it illegally in front of King's Plaza. We set up a table and we resold the records up until the point we were chased away by the police. At 17, I started a magazine called Guide Rule, which was for retailers advertising their goods, distributed through local supermarkets. We printed up about 10,000, made a $60 profit. We're very happy. My father was, a, uh, Oliver Shalom, was a survivor. He was a tailor in the United States. My mother once took us to his plant where he was working in the garment district, and I was in shock because I saw my father in almost a cage-like situation. He was wearing a wife beater, sweating, and I was totally startled. It haunts me to this day. Later on in his life, when he was 65, my father started a factory, a leather factory. He wanted us, my brother and myself, in the business. He even named it H&A, Harold and Arthur, and no way did I want a part of that. I wanted nothing to do with it. He had to end up closing the business a few years later because of health reasons. He started a store after that. Uh, when I was in college, I was working at a minimum of two jobs at a time. Uh, I took the easiest courses in college, and those courses were TV and film. I was dating Nan, and then one day Nan approaches me, and we were serious, and approaches me in the middle of the quad at Brooklyn College, and she says, okay, what are you going to do to earn a living with the rest of your life? I said, no problem, I'm gonna be a director, I'm gonna be a producer. No problem. She says, come on, show me. So I went on a journey to show that I could get a job. Well, employment agency after employment agency, there was nothing there. There were a lot of people, but no jobs. And the two things that really set me off was we went to the movies one night in the city and we were passing the ABC building and I went over to the guard outside at night and I said, um, how does somebody get inside that building? And he said, I don't know. I've been waiting here seven years. That hit me, and then a professor, who was the number one professor in Brooklyn College uh, for television, Dr. Erickson, told our class, he always told it like it was, that nobody in our class was gonna be employed in the film or television business, at best will be used car salesmen. So I went into a minor depression, uh, maybe it was more than minor, for a while, and uh, I took a course, I was taking a course called Alternative Television, and the professor held up a porta pack, which was the first portable video unit. Nobody knew about VHS or anything back then. And I had my aha moment, I had experience in retail, I had an idea that I, I could do videos for stores, play them in the windows, people would stop, they would come in, and we can build the business from there. So Nan and I borrowed $2,000, we started the company, and lo and behold, we put the first video unit in a store on Kings Highway in a place called The Close Horse, and the sun hit the window and you could not see the TV. So <laughs> it ended again for me right there, but we went at it. We put things on the window, screens, everything, nothing worked. We kept going back to retailers, 
One retailer said, I have a store in the mall. Why don't we try it there? And it worked. And fortunately, we were able to go into a number of malls uh, playing our units and it attracted people into the stores and we ended up doing work for large corporations. Malls then kicked us out, meaning they didn't allow the TVs in front of the stores. And fortunately, we were able to, some of the stores we did work were, were for were large chains and we were able to do work internally doing video corporate uh, communication work. And the ups and downs and the resentment I had from my father and mother who made me work all the time is gone. I appreciate the ups and downs, and I so appreciate the idea that I had to work, and I had to keep coming back for myself. In 1984, I cold called a man by the name of Bernie Goldhurst in Boston when I was on a shoot in Boston. Bernie is the founder and visionary of Inc. Magazine. And I went to see him to try and convince him to do a video, and he wanted to do a video. He said, we have to tell the story of the entrepreneur because Madison Avenue, the advertising agencies have no idea how powerful they are, and other people have no idea how important and critical the entrepreneur is to the economy of the United States. That's in 1984, before entrepreneurship was popular, and he was so right. So we did hundreds of videos uh, from that, educational videos. Then we ended up with other organizations doing vertical videos, meaning uh, black entrepreneurs, Latino entrepreneurs, women entrepreneurs, veteran entrepreneurs, salon owner entrepreneurs, young entrepreneurs, everything but Jewish entrepreneurs. And uh, we were doing a lot of work for Hillel, and I got to know the uh, CEO, Eric Fingerhut, who is now the CEO of the Jewish Federation of North America. And I said, you know, entrepreneurship education is very important in school. He says, you don't have to tell me. So I told them the idea, we would go out, we would get great Jewish entrepreneurs, I'm sure they'll participate, and um, they funded what you're, partially funded what you're about to experience. So I'm gonna play um, the intro to the program where you'll introduce yourself to all the players on the program and the subjects, but a couple of updates are needed. Uh, this was released a few years ago, and since then, Adam Newman, who's probably, if you're into business, you know who he is. He's the founder of WeWork and not great press right now, but I think he's a very special person. When we recorded this, um, he was doing about, he was valued at about $6 billion. When we were editing it, he was valued at eight, $10 billion. When we, after we released it, it went up to $48 billion. Um, now he's, of course, not there anymore, but there are lessons to learn from anyone, especially people that fail. Amnon Shashua sold his business, Mobileye, for $15 billion to Mobileye. And a very special young lady, Kira Radinsky, who is the founder of Sales Predict, sold, sold her company since the recording to eBay for about $30 million. She became the chief scientist at eBay. And um, since then, she left and co-founded another company in Israel called Diagnostic Robotics, which is involved in the medical field. So I'm going to share what we have now on the screen. And here we go. Young people innovate, old people stagnate. Entrepreneurs have a vision about how to make it. I had no vision. I was just naive enough to pull this off. I thought I was going to have a stroke. And we actually took a credit line on our house. I recall two or three times almost getting kicked out of high school. They said, you're in labor. I said, what time is this baby coming? I said, because I have a two o'clock meeting I have to go to. You are going to go in places that no one went before. In Hebrew, we called this chutzpah. The following program from Hillel International, the world's largest Jewish campus organization, is an in-depth learning experience that will guide you on starting and growing a business. This program will start with information that any first-time entrepreneur can use to launch a new business, evolving to more advanced information that will help even existing entrepreneurs. Additionally, this program will examine entrepreneurship from a Jewish perspective. 
demonstrating how Jewish values play a key role in building successful businesses that are changing the world for the better. Since there's no one right way to create a business, the program will present multiple approaches to entrepreneurship. I started with without a business plan. I developed business plan after business plan. You will be advised by 15 highly successful Jewish entrepreneurs on what it takes to build a business calling upon Jewish culture and values. Adam Newman is a founding partner of WeWork, a real estate company that rents collaborative working spaces in dozens of locations in the U.S. and abroad, currently valued at over $10 billion. Amnon Shoshua is the co-founder and CTO of Mobileye, a driver assist technology. In addition to being valued at over $10 billion, it is the most successful IPO of an Israeli company in U.S. history. The technology has saved dozens of lives. He also founded OrCam, which produces assistive devices for the visually impaired. Ben Fishman, the founder of Lids, Rulala, and Launch, grew Lids from a hat cart in a mall to having over 1,000 locations. He sold Rulala, an invitation-only shopping site, for over $350 million. Jay Steinfeld, founder and CEO of Blinds.com, grew a mom-and-pop blind store into the largest e-commerce retailer of blinds and window coverings in the world, which was recently acquired by Home Depot. Daniel Lubetsky, the founder of Kind Healthy Snacks and PeaceWorks, has led a company that has sold over 1 billion bars and over 150,000 stores. Eva Bronner, the president and CEO of the Bronner Group, has leveraged minority set-asides to expand her professional services firm from a one-woman business to over 10 offices, practicing in a dozen states and 400 jurisdictions. Seth Goldman, the co-founder of Honest Tea, grew the reach of his company to 100,000 stores, eventually selling the drink to Coca-Cola. Ben Brothman, the founder of Brothman & Associates, has represented prominent figures such as Sean P. Diddy Combs, Dominique Strauss-Kahn, Michael Jackson, and Jennifer Lopez. Diane Hassan, the CEO of the Startup Institute and the founder of Communispace, sold her business to Omnicom for over $100 million and now educates people on how to become part of a startup. Kira Radinsky, the CTO and co-founder of Sales Predict, created a technology that uses data from the web to help businesses predict sales. She's been featured in Forbes 30 Under 30 in Enterprise Tech, and MIT Technology Review's 35 Young Innovators Under 35. Natan Barak, the CEO of Impressed, leveraged his experience as a colonel in the Israeli Navy to develop key software components for Israel's Iron Dome system. Noah Minst, the 15-year-old founder of Nannies by Noah, serves over 190 clients and has appeared on CNN, Today, and CNBC. Michael Steinhardt was one of the first hedge fund managers, developing a net worth of over a billion dollars, a large portion of which he has given to Jewish causes, including co-founding the Togli Birthright Program. Talia Mashiach, the founder and CEO of Evid, raised over $9.5 million in venture capital to build a Pritzker Group-backed company, automating the $770 billion event industry with a collaborative procurement platform servicing over 5,000 users. She's a recipient of Ernst & Young's Winning Women Award and Chicago Cranes 40 Under 40. Ori Levine, the co-founder of Waze, sold his real-time driver navigation technology to Google for $1 billion. Following the success of Waze, he found VX, a free service that helps users track financial fees. These featured entrepreneurs will guide you through starting and growing a business in 15 chapters. In Who is an Entrepreneur, you'll hear about characteristics and traits that entrepreneurs share, as well as the first entrepreneurial experiences of our featured entrepreneurs. No, I'm going to have a sense of optimism and desire. So you have an idea, we'll delve into finding an idea for a viable business, testing the feasibility of that idea, and selling that idea to a first customer. It was identifying what the consumer wanted, understanding where the void was in the marketplace, and seeing if we could fill that void. Are You Ready shares the stories of how our featured entrepreneurs cope with the ups and downs of the entrepreneurial life, such as staying focused, overcoming failure, and finding a mentor who has been there before. You don't need to explain anything to anybody who have answers for for in business planning, our featured entrepreneurs will share ideas about having a business plan. The most important thing before you ever even think of going to a VC is truly understanding what's your business, how do you make money, 
and how are you going to continue to grow it? Financing your business will cover how to approach investors for funds. You need to take into consideration that the investors are also users. Sales mentality and dynamics provides insight into developing a selling process, finding customers, and negotiating. You figure out your sales process, and then you see that it's repeatable, and it's really about getting enough customers into the funnel. Real marketing touches on building a brand through advertising, market research, and customer service. Grow the business based on customer service. Ask your customers to be a reference customer. Hiring examines how to build a successful team covering all aspects of the hiring process. We call it sort of organ rejection. The wrong person can negatively affect the business just as powerfully as the right person can. Driving people performance shows how to create a culture of success with your employees. Everyone is a partner in this business from the porter that pains to the community manager. In leadership, our featured entrepreneurs share their philosophies on leadership. We were at 500 people and I still knew everybody's names. Jewish heritage and entrepreneurial success takes a look at how the legacy of the Jewish people has been conducive to success in business. Jews predominantly uh, develop a good work ethic, their families stress education. In Ethics of the Founders, our featured entrepreneurs argue the importance of giving back to the world, explaining ways that they give back and suggestions to ensure that Jews continue to be a light upon nations. The company will not have a spirit, it will not exist. 40 Great Ideas calls upon both our featured entrepreneurs as well as a number of other successful Jewish entrepreneurs to provide 40 great insights that can be called upon at any time during your entrepreneurial journey. We just couldn't let these people down and that's what kept us going through, through the hard years. Is that Cool Words of Wisdom provides some final personal guidance before you embark upon the entrepreneurial journey. The problem with most... So I'm going to pause, I'm going to pause it there and move on to the next uh, chapter. What you'll see is um, an introduction here when you get, if you take the video, we also have nine different professors and deans, Jewish professors and deans from Ivy League schools like Yale, Wharton, um, Stanford and others. So I'm gonna go into the first chapter now. And I want you to keep an eye on uh, the revealing that they share, they share with you the internal makeup of their characters and where they come from and who is an entrepreneur. Uh, what are the common characteristics? What are the circumstances? What is the thinking? Now also note that most of 90% of these people have not come from wealth. They, and they all did it on their own, meaning they used their own funds. In particular, I want to point out uh, Daniel Lebetsky, the founder of Kind, who, by the way, this year broke a billion dollars in sales. Um, he put himself, he comes from Mexico and a wealthy family, but uh, he left McKinsey, a great job at McKinsey and Company, and he had a vision for these Kind bars. And he said, I'm doing it all by myself. I'm going to scrape and struggle, get a tiny little apartment in New York, where, which was his warehouse. He went to bodegas by himself, and he wanted to get through that struggling process because he found it was really critical to him. And you know, think about when you see some of his story, why that might be. Um, we're gonna share, we're gonna see what the makeup and the attitude is of the guests on our program. So just bear with me when I get to the next. Okay. I think I'm a little bit of a poster child for ADD. Gunslinger. Non-conformist. Dreamer. Sense of optimism. Big desire. Perseverance. Rebellion. Very tough. Vision. Tenacity. All of those are a product of where we come from, who we are today, and all of those pieces together make us someone else tomorrow. There is no question that my dad's experiences during the Holocaust made me eternally mindful of my mortality, both of the need for me to build bridges with people to prevent what happened to him from happening to others, but also for me to develop skill sets so that if ever I'm in the middle of a war, 
I know how to survive. I think about like, oh, I speak so many languages. I love when I'm in a taxi, uh, talking to taxi drivers in their own language and showing a few, I know like a few phrases in like 40 or 50 languages. I was born in Kiev. There was no food, there was really bad, there was a lot of anti-Semitism. I came to Arizona when I was four, the first time um, Jewish people could actually leave uh, USSR. People couldn't bring any money, couldn't bring any diplomas, nothing. So it came just with your luggage. Every time that somebody could help me from around, I always got this help. Um, when I was five, the neighbor uh, girl just came. She was also five and she gave me all the old toys. When we came, we were the poor. And uh, today, I always try to give uh, back, at least with the same values that I was brought up. I lived in 13 different places until I moved to the U.S. when I was 23. I was in uh, four different high schools and probably four other schools. And I had to go through uh, many different communities. And every time you go to a new high school or a new school as a kid, it's not an easy thing. And you learn from that. You learn that uh, you have to be compassionate for others. Because when you're the new kid, it's only those kids that are going to treat you nicely that are going to become your friends. And very difficult thing. And suddenly you become friends with everybody. And a year later or a month later, someone else comes with a new person. And if you, were, if you understood how hard it was for you and you're compassionate for that next person, then you can take care of them. And those are some of the bases of my experience in life that have led me towards this business. We did not have a lot growing up. My father uh, repaired sewing machines. And my mom almost always worked and was a secretary in a library. And they wanted me to be a home economics teacher because when I was growing up, the smart girls were teachers. And I was a good cook. I said, I don't know. I don't want to be a home economics teacher. I want to major in economics. And my rebellion will be that I will be the first person in my family to graduate from college. And I'm going to do things that my parents don't even understand. And they'll be so proud. They won't believe it. I grew up in uh, Williamsburg, Crown Heights, Bell Harbor, and uh, ultimately began working when I was 10, 11 years old. I was mowing lawns one summer without a power mower and uphill. What I saw growing up was that the people who were really successful uh, paid their dues unless they inherited it. And since I wasn't going to inherit wealth and success, I either was going to create it for myself or I was just gonna be just another person working and hopefully getting by. I grew up in a lower middle class neighborhood in Brooklyn called Bensonhurst. We had vast ambition and very little money. If you know that the future is murky and difficult and unsure, you're going to struggle that much more. And struggling really matters. So that's a key statement, I believe, from Mr. Steinhardt. Let me, uh, that's a key statement that, about the struggle. Let's go back a little bit and a quick review on here. And it's invaluable content, uh, I believe, not only for ourselves to do a self-analysis if we're going to start a business, but certainly for uh, child rearing, some of the things that come out here. Now, isn't it interesting that Daniel says that he put himself in a position that if there was a war, remember he grew up with a Holocaust survivor as a father who told him stories. So he needed to know, in my opinion, that he needed to know that no matter what would happen, that he would have the skill set to survive. And you know, you know, this isn't news to most people here. Um, a great percentage of survivors are entrepreneurs. And it's incredible, it's, it, to me it's enlightening that a man like this, Daniel Lebetsky, uh, has put himself in this position, thinks that way in order to grow that, he needed to do that to struggle to grow the business. He also revealed that he had a purpose, he was a reflection of being, to being kind and a mission and compassion. That word compassion is gonna come up a lot. The same with Kira Radinsky who grew up in bad poverty in Russia, anti-Semitism, business entrepreneurship became a way out. And she mirrored, she mirrored that compassion when she was, what she was given as a child by neighbors 
uh, in her life's calling. Because what's not said here, it's said later on in the program, which I'm not gonna share with you now, is that I had asked her, I said, like what's really driving you? Sales predict, she's developed uh, concepts and algorithms and philosophies on how to predict the future, how to predict in this case, company's future with regard to sales and where they're gonna be in positions. And uh, she said ultimately she feels this kind of uh, initiative would really work well in medicine. And that's what she wants to do, to come up with solutions in the medical fields that will bring treatments uh, earlier and quicker. And so she ended up selling the company, worked as a chief scientist, and that's what she's doing right now. She's working, she started diagnostic robotics, and she's involved with uh, the current epidemic uh, that we're experiencing. You can look it up and you'll see some of the things she's doing. Adam, who had the fastest growing company, was rated the number one entrepreneur on the 40 a few years ago in the world, uh, failed. Uh, he failed before, which you won't hear uh, today. He had three other business, but he kept coming back. He moved in his life, as you heard, from kibbutz to kibbutz to kibbutz, which was served as the foundation for his co-working idea in uh, starting WeWork. And again, you heard him talk about having compassion, one for the other. Uh, Diane, for Diane, it was a way out of what was prescribed for her, uh, not to be uh, the teacher, which is a great profession, but she wanted to do it on herself, so she had faith in herself. And Michael, like I said earlier, had a key statement that there's value in this struggle. So I'm trying to build a case now for the ingredients, the foundation, of long-term success in, in building something. For parents in particular, it's important to grasp this idea, embrace the value of failing, and the idea of keeping coming back. That we know it, we see it. The, the, the idea of instant gratification is destructive. The United States for the first time in the last few years, I think it started about four years ago, um, started to see a decrease in the amount of startups per capita. And there's some thinking that because of the technology and everything that our children have uh, available to them for instant, and ourselves, for instant gratification, it destroys the process that brings you to the great characteristic of persistence, which is needed in building and starting, starting and building a business. I taught a class in Brooklyn College a couple of years ago using a different entrepreneurial videotape on young entrepreneurs, and it was an entrepreneur's class. So every, there were 60 students, uh, I had taught one session, and every one of the students had ideas for starting a business. So I said, I'm gonna call on five of them. And the first four I called on, each one of them, I said, what's your idea? And then I gave them a reason why it wouldn't work why it wasn't a good idea, why somebody else might be doing the same thing. It didn't take much to say, well, I'll try something else. And they just moved on quickly. The fifth person, a young man from Russia, said, kept coming back, I'm gonna, I'll make it work, I'll make it work. And that's the kind of thing that's needed, I believe, in doing anything, in creating anything special. Our own history shows that. Uh, in the 90s, when entrepreneurship did start catching on and was recognized um, at, the, at the values it should be recognized for, big companies started putting in programs, what they called intrapreneurship, creating entrepreneurs within companies. And what happened was it didn't work. So the New York Times did a study on why it didn't work. And the conclusion was that these entrepreneurs were overfunded. Let's go a little bit deeper into the entrepreneurial traits and the character development. I remember my mother at my bat mitzvah and her speech was Talia is a can-do person. So I think what that really means is a, a strong sense of perseverance. Um, all good things have challenges. And I think it's um, when you're going through something, you can look at it as uh, a challenge that you will overcome and you will learn from. Dyslexia was probably one of my biggest challenges, but also turned to be my biggest opportunity. 
because as a kid, I couldn't read until I was in the third grade. And even in the third and fourth grade, I just started reading. I always had to figure out when there were tests or different things, other solutions of how to get it. I had to ask for favors. I had to take other people's notes because I wouldn't write in class. I had to figure out different ways of doing things. So when I'm asked, when was the first time you were entrepreneurial? I think the first time I was entrepreneurial was dealing with dyslexia. I was always creative and I always found interesting ways to get things done. Rarely did I get things done um, in the simplest and most straightforward way. I often found a creative way to get things done. I would go into school and come up with a bunch of very interesting reasons why work wasn't done. And my teachers would always give me A's for creativity. Rarely did they give me A's for the work that was done. I think it's more about leadership necessarily, perhaps, than entrepreneurship. Uh, I was president of my student council in grammar school, in junior high, in high school, very active, and then active politically. My second grade teacher told me I'd be the first female president. The characteristics to that the entrepreneurs need to have is the first one is probably courage, right? Because you are going to go in places that no one went before. Entrepreneurs have a vision about how to make it, and the vision is different, and they're not afraid about making it happen. When I run, I always imagine myself at the end, because I don't like running. It's actually pretty hard, but I imagine the feeling when it's going to be when I finish it, when I reach my goal. And the moment I imagine it, it has to happen, right? When I started even my PhD, I had this idea that we can take data on the web and make predictions out of it. I came to my advisor and told him about this idea, and he told me that, well, this is a nice maybe project, not a PhD. And he said, I'm not sure it's even publishable. I was like, you know what? Let me do it as a project. Even he agreed. I made a project. I was like, hey, but if we already did it, maybe we should write an article about it. And this is how we actually started it. You have to be a good communicator. You know, you have to be able to share this message uh, with other people and get them to to buy into it. Entrepreneurs are really, really extroverted. I love the people part. I mean, I love being a CEO. When somebody says, "Can I have 15 minutes of your time?" I don't say, "Ah." Oh. You're going to be an entrepreneur, you need to accept rejection. You need to accept the fact that there are a thousand people exactly like you, and you have to be tenacious. You have to be persistent. You can't be depressed by it. I met a school principal. I was once sitting in his office crying. They hadn't done so well on a test they had said hard for, and he looked at me and he said, All you can do is fail forward. So that's sort of been my motto. Uh, and that was my motto in middle school, and now also, you have to fail forward and take the issues you have and embrace them and make something out of them. You have this impatience with what is, but you also have to have the patience to pursue it so that you have enough time to figure out what will work. All entrepreneurs look for ideas wherever they can find them. That means reading constantly and studying what you're reading and saying, what can I learn from that? How can I apply that to what I'm doing? I used to read biographies all the time. It was my favorite type of book. And I used to read biographies because I wanted to learn from other people. They could have been baseball players or inventors or business people as I got older. But it was always about what can I learn from other people's lives that I can apply to myself. I stopped playing ball in the schoolyard and used to go down on the subway to, to downtown Brooklyn and sit in brokers' offices where they smoked big cigars and watched a indeed a real ticker tape. And I just absorbed everything I could about the stock market. So uh, just to quickly review that chapter, what did we identify? It's so telling that Adam looked at an obstacle, a challenge in his life, his dyslexia, as an opportunity. And you'll find that with many entrepreneurs. And I said to him, uh, which he talks about later in the program, I said, Adam, this is gonna go to 600 of the best colleges in the world. Many of the students, um, they don't have these kind of challenges, but they want to build that kind of character. They know that when they see something like this, they'll need to, they, they will understand the need to build that kind of strength, that kind of, uh, attitude of keep coming. So he said that if you come from that kind of background, get yourself an adversary who will consistently challenge you and consistently 
have you understand what failing is and coming back is. Now, isn't that the path of our people? The Torah is, is imbued with stories of us taking so long to get to a destination. And God even said after the crossing of the Red Sea, you're gonna take the long way around. Why were we in Egypt for hundreds of years? Why was it 10 plagues? There's, learned, there's lessons to be had. Kira, Kira talks about the idea of vision. If you can't see where you're going, how you are gonna get there. Again, um, she was rejected in school for her PhD. These are constant things that are gonna come up. Rejection, failure, being positive about it, keep coming back. Michael uh, Steinhardt sacrificed his youth in essence to pursue uh, this business. He didn't go to the schoolyard anymore. And again, you keep hearing the idea of compassion from different people. Think about why that compassion attitude, that attribute is so important. Adam said it earlier, if you're compassionate for someone else, you're standing in their shoes. You understand what's happening to them. You're understanding what their needs are. You're understanding what their goals are. And that allows you to be a great marketer. So you can then design your offering to those particular needs. And what we'll also find out, so you pick your customer, your compassionate person, you understand what their needs are, you satisfy it, and also the team around you. You'll find in successful businesses, I, I would say it's 95% of the time, the, the entrepreneur, the, the CEO, is taking very, very good people, care of their people. So entrepreneurship is a Jewish story. It requires the attributes that we developed through the events in our history and the Torah that we were given, fraught with challenges and failures and ups and downs and the need for a belief system, a ride that demands and yields passion and persistence. And we also understand the value, I'm gonna to have to, the value of compassion. So let me share this with you. And responsibility. This obligation to do better things becomes part of your everyday existence. A company will not have a spirit. It will not exist. Ethics of the founders will be led by Yavila McCoy of Dimensions Educational Consulting. As a Jew of color, building a diversity consulting business has helped me to give back to my community by providing resources for the integration of Jewish diversity within Jewish outreach spaces. Building new ideas and finding ways to give back to our community can change the world. Your leadership and imagination as a Jewish entrepreneur can make all the difference. Okay, so you've gotten this far in the program. You've taken your idea and created a profitable business. However, there is more to life than business and just making money. As Sales Predict co-founder Kira Radinsky suggests, in a way we emulate the creator when we create something out of nothing, like a business. A business is a living entity that requires processes, rules, interactions. And as Empress CEO Natan Barak says, a nishama, a spirit. A living enterprise is a reflection of its founder's personality, creativity, values. It represents what you represent. Because Jews are called to be a or lagoyim, a light unto the nations, Jewish leaders have a deep responsibility and a heritage to live up to. In reference to entrepreneurship, think about these poignant thoughts written by Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel. We will either forfeit or enrich the legacy of the ages. We are the most challenged people under the sun. Our existence is either superfluous or indispensable to the world. We should be pioneers as were our fathers 3,000 years ago. 
entrepreneurs are certainly pioneers. Thinking about this program and where you are at and will be and what this means to you as an entrepreneur, perhaps this is the very essence of your mission. Our featured business leaders have said that anything you do should be able to in some way change the world for the better. We call that tikkun olam, and part of your mission is to repair the world. In this chapter, you will experience the commonality of purpose among our featured entrepreneurs, the desire and the need to better the world, to give back, to do good, to build responsible businesses reflective of the tenets of Judaism, of the ethics of our fathers. There is also, by the way, a payback, and that is doing well by doing good. Many Jewish entrepreneurs feel the need to give back based on their upbringing. Trying to fix the world is a Jewish thing since 5,000 years ago. As part of being Jewish, I think part of what we learn is we, we have a, a big history behind us. We have difficult times, we have good times. But the one thing we know is whenever as Jewish people we acted as a community and we acted as a group, we've been able to do miraculous things. My father uh, was nine years old when the war started and he was in a concentration camp and he used to tell me stories as a little kid about how there were rare cases of people that amidst all of that darkness would see his humanity and would help him out. There was this German soldier that when nobody was watching threw a rotten potato by my dad's feet. I think he saw in my father that touch of humanity and I think that potato gave my dad not just nutritional sustenance but also some sense in his soul that there was humanity out there that the world was worth fighting for and that I think he, it impacted my father a lot that people showed him some kindness. Um, there was a superintendent in um, where they lived that walked to every apartment where there were Jews and showed the paramilitary forces where they were and they were all killed and he told my grandfather I'm sparing you because you just recognized me as a human being. And so I didn't tell them to exterminate you. He spared my family's life because my grandfather treated everybody with respect and with humanity. And I, I just think it's an important lesson for us, particularly when Jewish people have power, we, that power has, we carry a responsibility to behave with, um, respect towards everybody and towards ourselves and towards others and to, and to use that power for good to try to help others. So that's how I try to carry my life. I was so I'm concluding. Uh, that's very powerful stuff. It was hard to do that interview uh, because I certainly uh, understood where he was coming from. Uh, I want to conclude by saying some of the things you just heard and then we'll have questions um, that I'll, I see some came up, that we represent, I told you earlier that one of the definitions that I'm attracted to is that uh, entrepreneurship is the ultimate expression of oneself. We represent God, and perhaps God's greatest ability is to create something out of nothing. And when we create enterprises of any type, those enterprises are expressions of ourselves and everything that we represent. God told us in Kedoshim that you are holy, I am holy, and we must represent that. Maybe that's one of the reasons we're told that one of the first questions asked when we go to the next world is, how did you conduct yourself in business? We also represent our first entrepreneur, the first Jewish entrepreneur, the founder of monotheism, Avraham, Think about his characteristics, thinking about some of the things you just experienced. He had a vision. We know the Midrash about the castle, seeing the burning castle. And he said, there must be someone behind that. He had compassion, story after story. And the persistence and compassion combined in Sodom when he begged God, what if there's 50 people, 45 people, 30 people, 40 people, 30 people. He had faith the ultimate faith and sacrifice. We know about the Akedah. We knew that he kept coming back test after test after test. And a key component is revealed in what they called him, 
they called him the Ivrit, which means one from the other side. And in entrepreneurship, we'll learn later on, and you many know that right now, that being different, you must have a unique selling proposition. What is different about what you're doing, what you're offering? The idea of unique selling proposition comes from uh, one of the, the guy who wrote the Bible of the advertising industry, uh, David Ogilvy, and we can equate that to Kedusha. And what's the definition? One of the definitions of Kedusha, it's, it's holy, but it's also separate and being different. And so we featured a number of different kind of people that revealed themselves. I appreciate having this opportunity to having discussed this with you. Um, I put my uh, email on the top. Let me see if there's any questions. Um, okay, so one question is, uh, how is the programs being distributed? So we distributed this first through Hillel, who made it available with a workbook. The chapters are interactive, so you don't need a teacher really to work with it. They ask you questions, they set it up each chapter, they ask you questions at the end, and then in the workbook, um, it, it'll actually serve in the classroom to allow the students to respond. So that was the first distribution, and then we uh, were able to sign up a number of distributors that has made it available to libraries and to other uh, 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 high schools and colleges around the world. So the next question I have, was it easy to interest this? I tell you, um, we, was it easy to interest this group of entrepreneurs to participate? We're pretty good at getting people to give of their time to better the entrepreneurial world. We've always been able to get big name entrepreneurs in our various programs, but this was uh, the quickest result. When you called someone, even Daniel Levetsky or Uri Levine of Waze, um, it was, I would say we were about 60 or 70%. You were gonna be able to help not only the economies of America and Israel in fostering entrepreneurship, but it's gonna be a gift to the Jewish people. So we were able to get interest that way. We also also kind of a library of the work that we've done. So they saw we were legitimate. And then having Hillel behind it also gave it some authority. Um, so I think that's it from the question. I'd be interested in getting a copy. Of course, you can have a copy. You'll email me. The name is the email is right there. Uh, there's not any more questions. I'd like to thank. Again, Joey Schiff for working with making this happen, uh, Josh Quilter, and of course, Rabbi Wolf. Harold? Yes. I'd like to thank you for this uh, presentation, excellent presentation, very informative, and I'm sure that uh, people will, will be using your site in the future. I okay. guess I can contact you, right? Just send me an email and I'll send you the password and a link uh, to access the full series. Super. Thank you so much. Okay. Thanks, everyone.